Well, hey, all you wiretappers out there. I found an old video I did with our friend Cam Camulus Robinson from up Chicago way. You know, Cam's a great researcher. He had researched the Catena brothers uh, and mainly Gerardo or Jerry Catena. These were some New York guys. And, and Jerry was, uh, he made early connections with the Jewish gangster Longley Zwillman. Uh, he kind of operated over New Jersey as much as anything. He worked with a uh, racketeer, the real well-known racketeer, Willie Moretti. Anyhow, let's talk about Gerardo Jerry Catina, born in 1902. Uh, he's an old timer. He's one of the old school dudes. Yeah. That, uh, his oh, parents, yeah. I'm sure, came over from uh, Sicily more than likely so, yeah. in Italy. Uh, yes. he, as a young man, he got hooked up with the Jewish mob, uh, Longy Zwillen, uh, was his bodyguard and chauffeur, worked for Willie Moretti. Boy, he, this is a lot, of, a lot of names here. Yeah, he was he was in deep. Uh, and and in when, deep. who was the inspiration for Luca Brasi? Uh, was was that? uh, that's right. Willie Moretti was the inspiration for Luca Brasi. It's, it's kind of how I've always heard it told. Is is uh, you know he was he was kind of the the muscle for Frank Costello, and they always kind of when they wrote Luca Brasi, they had they had uh, Willie Moretti in mind. You see the pictures; he always kind of looked like like Luca Brasi. Oh, uh, cool, cool. Uh, you know, and, and so that put him in connection in close working relationship with all the mob bosses of the early uh, families, yeah. didn't it? Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, Joe Dadnois, uh, Vito Ginovese. Uh, what, I mean, they had a lot of stuff going on. Where did he fall into that? You know, he was, he stayed in Jersey and, but uh, because William Reddy was so well thought of, I mean, William Reddy was like the guy who met Joe Bonanno on the, you know, when he came in on the boat. William Reddy was sort of a, a, an older guy, so he was well thought of and kind of a mentor figure to these guys. So he fought in the Castellamorese War, um, uh, Catena did, and he was part of that upcoming group of, uh, of mobsters that, that really formed, you know, created the foundation for a lot of, for a lot of this uh, for a lot of what we consider the mob now, he was because he was tight with uh, Luciano and Costello. He sort of and and Adonis. He sort of fell into the what would be the Luciano family, and then right. later on the Costello and um, Genovese family. He was out of. He stayed in New Jersey, so he was kind of he was under Genovese the whole time. At that time, Genovese had uh, had New Jersey. Genovese and and Willie Moretti had. Uh, had New Jersey, uh, uh, then eventually uh, William Reddy got syphilis, and they had to sort of knock him off. But he eventually was always, yeah, a really he, smart guy in Jersey. Yeah, he eventually became uh, Gina Vese underboss. Is that right? Uh, correct. That right. Correct. Yeah. As 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 Gina Vese moved up, he uh, once he he came back from deportation, he had to sort of start a smear campaign against Costello and it took him several years and he went about getting his his capos in line guys like Tony Bender Strollo and uh, uh, the Catena brothers and these guys really came along Tommy Eboli and Mike Maraglia they came along to Genovese's side and they they bought in with with Genovese and thought that yeah Costello was was letting things slip and so when you see that change of power in 57, Genovese really had all the names with him. There was, there was a couple of holdouts, Little Augie Pisano stayed with, with, with Costello, but you really get that change of power in 57 when Genovese takes over. And because Catena was so close to Genovese, he really, he took over all of Jersey. Once Vito moved on to the head of basically all of New York, Catena gets promoted and he's running all Jersey operations. And he's also the underboss of the family, basically, at, at that time. He, because he's running the Jersey side, that really is a huge position of power in the Genovese family. You know, what, what I've read is, and he, this guy was a moneymaker, man. He Absolutely. Was, he, as as you, you so aptly put it, he would be what Sammy Gravano would call, call a racketeer and a gangster. I mean, yeah. uh, a, a racketeer, yeah. a, ra a racket is... Uh, is one thing, you know, being a racketeer, a racket is more like a union, the union rackets, the yes. protection racket. Uh, a gangster is a guy that goes out and kills people and, and robs people. <laughs> yeah. As to me, that's always the breakdown yeah. between a racketeer and a gangster. A racket is, is something that is uh, uh, not, it's a crime only if you do it in a certain way. Like if you manipulate exactly. a union, 
if you extort money out of a, a bank, if you actually steal the money, it's an embezzlement, that would be more like a gangster. But but if you're like, you're selling a protection to keep them from uh, having some kind of union trouble or, or some other kind of trouble, then that would be a racket. <laughs> so, uh, you know, to, to understand the difference in the two, they're, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty close together, but, but can, there is a subtle difference between a racketeer and a gangster. He could butter you up, but he can, he can shoot you too. You know, he had he had Longshore, he had the Jersey Longshoremen's uh, 1247. He owned the Butchers Union. He had a piece of the Teamsters. He he owned a, a couple of casinos. He had he had points in, in a couple of casinos. He was making forty five thousand dollars a month from a couple of casinos. He he was splitting a hundred with Meyer Lansky, and uh, uh, I think he owned he was a major stockholder in Valley. He split that with, uh, with casino, you know, they made uh, jukeboxes, uh, pinballs and slot machines. He split that with, uh, with uh, Chicago. They also had a, a large stake in Valley. So this guy was really, I mean, he would have, he's the kind of guy, when you hear a lot of people say, Oh, they would have been CEOs who weren't for crime. Jerry Gatana really fits that bill. I mean, like you see, that's he's three or four unions and, and he's, he's really diversified into casinos and, and corporations. He owns a lot of businesses around town. And as, as we'll see here in a minute, and he's also got, you know, he's also got his crew underneath him. So he, he was really well diversified and you've got guys on the recordings talking about him in the sixties talking about, Oh, he's, a, he's the richest guy in the mob. He's a millionaire many times over. And so, just with his legitimate rackets, Jerry Catena was worth millions. Uh, interesting, you know, because I tell you what, these guys in Kansas City, and, and most of them in Chicago, except maybe for Anthony Accardo, they 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 just live like uh, a plumber, a good plumber, or a good electrician yeah. would live. A lot of policemen that got up, you know, maybe got up to promoted up to captain or something. They, even the highest ranking people uh, uh, live like kind of like a normal person who has gotten into middle management and whatever their business is. Uh, <laughs> they all live just like that. They drive cars like that and, uh, drive, and really have bank accounts like that. For the most part, they may have a bunch of cash money hit out someplace or got points in the, uh, in, the, some business somewhere that they get some kind of under the table thing or like the skim coming from a casino, but even the skim coming from the, yeah. the casino, he was doing next developers dividing that up all over the place. You know, he had to pay yeah. off his teamster. He had to pay off about 10 guys that worked for him. There were his made guys. And of course it commands a lot of loyalty if you want something done. So it's not, it's not a lot of them. I think it's not really for the money. It's more for the life and yeah, the power right. over people and, and to have that, that position you know, to what they wanted ever since they were a little kid <laughs> to be a big shot in the mafia as opposed to the money. Now, this guy here was a lot about all about the money, it seems to me like. He was, I, yeah, I, you know, a lot of these Jersey guys, you know, it, it really did have the big houses. Anastasia had a castle, and the guy, uh, Richie the Boot, Boyardo, had a, had a bunch of statues of all his families in this oh, really? massive house in Jersey. And <laughs> I believe that Katana had a good sized house. So a lot of the Jersey guys really bucked the trend. And they were really money hungry. I know uh, Genovese had the big house, and that was kind of what was odd about the Jersey Crew. And I think you see that in a lot of a lot of aspects of of, of <laughs> Jersey is you really do. It is sort of the more living large. <laughs> the Jersey of, Shore people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now you got to be careful. I, we may have some fans I, in New Jersey. And I, now you're you know, slandering and everybody from New I Jersey. I love <laughs> I love my family from New Jersey up in Sussex and Butler. <laughs> And down, uh, down towards the shore, I love my family, but there is a Jersey lifestyle, and whether you're a mobster or, or, or what have you. Or you have a reality TV Jersey show. Lifestyle. That's right. You adhere to the Jersey style, and, and God bless Jersey for it. I love, I do love Jersey. Well, uh, it's, <laughs> it certainly is a diverse state, I understand. You, you go over, it's called the, what, the Garden State, and, and you Absolutely. go away from from beautiful, you know, woods and, and out in the country, uh, uh, pastoral scenes to uh, Jersey City and, and nothing but, uh, well, what Tony Soprano sees on his way into to work every day, if you remember that, with Tony Soprano's view from his car on the way to work, you see uh, uh, all these. Uh, uh, yeah, what exit off the turnpike are you? Yeah, really, uh, like, uh, 
oil oil plants, old oil refining plants, and and run down the warehouses, and the, all the shipping's gone now out of New Jersey. And it's just you know known to be Cam was it not Camden? That's a that's a capital I think, but I can't think of the other names besides Jersey City. That that kind of is the epitome of it. Although it's starting to build back up and get gentrified now, because you can you can take a boat. Yeah. They built a whole bunch of really nice apartments that are really inexpensive, and you can take a 15-minute boat ride across, is that the East River, the right. Hudson River, uh, from, from, Jer River. from jo yeah, Jersey Shore, Hoboken, that's the other one I was we'll trying to think of. Take the path over from Hoboken. Uh, and you can, take, well, you can take a ferry, 15-minute ride on ferry, and be right at Midtown Manhattan and, and be, you know, jump on a train and be at your work in, in 30 minutes or less. So, And it's a lot cheaper <laughs> to not have to live in Manhattan, as we all know. This yeah, so this is the Sands, the Fremont, the Horseshoe casinos. This three, I always want to like trace down and see who owned what casino throughout the years. You know, you ever because yeah. these different guys owned owned every different kind of casino throughout. But for the purposes of our story today, the Catena brothers, Gene and Jerry, owned a distribution firm called Best Sales, and they they sold goods and services throughout the area. Uh, you know, wholesale goods. And Best Sales got a big contract from a, a company called Ecology Corp, which was a subsidiary of the North American Chemical Company. And North American Chemical sold cleaning products and household goods. And they had a, a detergent project product, and it went by a bunch of different names, uh, Bohack, and uh, uh, I believe at this time it was called Polyclean. I can only find one source for that, but I found a couple other sources that said it was Ecology and Bohack. So they had a bunch of different names on this one product. And in the early 60s, this product was found to be dangerous to consumers. But North American Chemical had a bunch of it. They had a whole, <clears throat> they had already made up several batches and they didn't stop. So there's a lot of ways to look at this. The North American needed to distribute this. So they, sought out, either intentionally or unintentionally, the uh, Catena brothers at best sales. I kind of think, looking at a business, looking at, it's hard to believe that, that a distributor would not know that they were dealing with the mob in North Jersey. Anyway, so North American contracts out best sales to distribute their dangerous to users product. Their sales jumped from three million to five million in one year. And best, as best sales, the, the Catena's company becomes their exclusive distributor. So their methods are a little bit unorthodox. They, owning their butchers, they, they threaten to, uh, to, to, to go on strike, to stop cutting meat for, for stores that, uh, for small grocers. They threaten, the Teamsters threaten to refuse to deliver trucks to stores that won't buy uh, products from best services. They, unless you buy a pallet, will break all your windows, things like that. And so really best sales does great business of this uh, detergent. You know, membership has its privileges. Uh, their next project, they want to move on to the uh, Atlantic Pacific Tea Company, the a &P. It's the biggest, biggest grocery store up there. So a &P does their research. They're a big, they're a big national store. And they discover that this, detergent is is dangerous they, so they don't want to carry it and in addition uh, they say that the they learn that the best sales is a mob owned company and they want nothing to do with that so the Catena brothers find this out and Gene Catena is on an illegal wiretap saying he wants to knock AMP's brains in and so this is a national corporation, and this is the mafia wants to wants to go to war with it. These Katana brothers. This is this is how this is how we go. <laughs> you know, here, here in Kansas City, one time we were up on I had a microphone put in a it was called uh, rely it was a reliable produce ABC produce. They always use these generic names like best <laughs> products. Anytime you got a company that says best products, you know, be careful. <laughs> Right. So it, uh, some kind of real generic name, and they were selling uh, mainly condiments and things to bars, and uh, they had some contacts to sell produce and from the market. They'd go down and pick up the produce. Somebody else would store it, but they didn't own it. They would then go get it. They'd have some bars that they were supplying and supplying produce, and but a lot of mainly a lot of condiments and 
uh, and like olives and, and things that didn't have to be stored uh, like a regular produce does. Right. Uh, so, so they were complaining about business was down and they were just kind of talking back and forth and Corky comes in and, and he, you know, what you, what's going on here? Yeah, you know, business is down, you know, sales are way off this month. And he said, what? Well, he said, here's what you got to do. He said, you got to go around and find these goombas and put some pressure on them. And then he named off several <laughs> Italian last name people in the city that were not buying from them. And, and so that was, you know, he looked then for looking for restraint, <laughs> what we call restraint of trade and, and uh, uh, in, in the marketplace and, and extortion. When it comes in, it turns into extortion in the end, more than likely. But uh, that, you know, easy, that's how, that's how they solution. work. Yeah, easy, easy solution. Easy solution. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, all these things these guys were doing, they just happened. You know, it's a small town, a small Italian community, and they just happen to grow up, you know, in the Italian community, but it's a small community, and so everybody knows everybody. And they know who has, you know, who's a bar owner, who's a restaurant owner, and, and yeah. um, they just go out and say, hey, you know, you got to buy from us. He didn't say exactly what they were going to do, but when Cork Savella says, we're going to put some pressure on these goombas to buy from, from our company here, you know what that means. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> No real good sexy say, language on that thing, but you know what that means. You don't say no. Yeah, do not say no. Offer they cannot refuse, as the man said. I, <laughs> I tell you what, when they coined that term, that, that uh, Mario Puzo, when he wrote that he line. On the money, wasn't he? <laughs> little did he know people would use that. <laughs> I want to write a line like that. Shit. <laughs> do you think he got that from real from reality? you think he... Uh, Got that? You know, shit. I don't. I don't know. You know, I know that situation is supposed to be like uh, what that was actually happened with Willie Moretti and Tommy Dorsey talking about uh, uh, Frank Sinatra's contract when he was in Tommy Dorsey's big band. I don't. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't. I, I think that probably Puzo came up with that line. It's just a damn good line that a young writer might come up with. You know? Hey, really, that's good. So anyhow, I, I digress. We're yeah, we're so here with they're putting pressure on the the A and P to buy nineteen poly clean stuff, which is dangerous to consumers. <laughs> tell you what's more con, more dangerous to consumers is the the Katana Brothers. 19, <laughs> 1964, Molotov cocktail thrown into an A and P in Yonkers and it burns to the ground. June of sixty four, Molotov is thrown in in Peekskill, New York. August, another. Another bomb burns out a store on First Avenue in Manhattan. Dang. December of 64, they burn down a fourth store in the Bronx. They don't get the message then. So January of 23rd, an A&P manager, uh, James Walsh, is driving home. His tire feels a little bit flat. He pulls over to check it. And car pulls up and shoots him to death. Well, he got serious. February, yeah, February 5th. Uh, the Bronx A&P manager, John Mosner, was driving home to his place in Elmont. He gets out of his car in the driveway. Gunman pulls up and kills him. And then April of 65, another A&P in the Bronx is firebombed. And while this is going on, the Butcher's Union is negotiating a new contract with A&P. They're making these outrageous demands that, that A&P could never meet, talking about a two-hour workday and all kinds of ridiculous things. And then the Teamsters local is telling A&P at all their stores that if the butchers go on strike, well, like when the butchers go on strike, yeah. they will refuse to cross the picket line. So A&P will have no trucks coming into their stores if the butchers go on strike. The butchers are guaranteeing they're going on strike. So a and like, what the hell is going on? Like, really? our entire operation shut down. They don't even know what the cause is. So the FBI has their, their wiretaps going. They know what's going on, but this is still at the point when they don't want the mob to know that they've got wiretaps everywhere. So their hands are kind of tied in that they, they want to communicate this information, but they can't say where they got it. So they call Jerry Katana before a federal grand jury, and he says, I don't know what you're talking about. They're like, oh, you've been uh, shopping at the A&P lately. And so they couldn't prosecute because of how they got the information. But he kind of understood that they were watching him. He didn't know how they kind of were watching him. So he did step back, and they let the A&P go. The whole time, A&P didn't ever know what was going on with their stores. They just thought they were having a terrible run of bad luck. Hmm. And uh, so they never, they never really got it. 
Uh, so in 1967, North American Chemical decides they're going to discontinue their relationship with Best Sales. I guess they've gone as far as they can go. And the containers say, well, it's going to cost you 24000 a year for the next 13 years to buy out our contracts, whether we work for you or not. And North American Chemical, basically, that's you're looking at about you know, close to 300000 a year, which is fine because that's significantly less than 10% of the of of the profits that North American made from working with the Katana brothers. So really the Katana brothers probably should have asked for a little bit more. Uh, later in 1970, after the Katana brothers had shut down and moved on, North America was still in business and the government seized close to a thousand cases of this toxic detergent and they had just changed the name to Ecology and Bohack. So even with the Katana brothers gone and paid off, having made less than 10% of, of this huge corporation's profits, the corporation 10 years later is still selling this toxic detergent. They've just changed the name. <laughs> so it sounds to me like, you know, before I read that, I thought, oh, this poor, this, this poor business is being taken, taken advantage of by these mob guys. But I think these mob guys were taken advantage of by this damn, by this damn <laughs> North American chemical. They, they brought them in. They did all their dirty work. They didn't even give them 10%. And then as soon as they moved on, they're still selling this damn dangerous detergent. I, I think that North American is the real gangsters here. And they, and they got the contract with A&P, which was <laughs> right. the big back they, then. That they was the big, big, big store back then. <laughs> But you, if you get, it's like getting something at Walmart today, you can, you can exactly, kind of absolutely. And I got a buddy that did some inventing stuff and he came up this one thing. It was kind of, it was more like a one-off deal that was kind of a impulse buy if you wanted it. And, and he almost got into Walmart. He knew if he got oh. into Walmart and they put these things on an end cap, you know, his, his future was assured, but oh my God. at very last, he just couldn't quite pull, get the trigger pulled on it with whoever you got to hire somebody to go negotiate with Walmart, but to get something into a big store, like that big chain, get your product in that. It's uh, I, I got yeah. another buddy I went to law school with. They, uh, they developed a uh, barbecue sauce and a, a rub they were working back east they're working for a congressman or for a senator and so they developed this barbecue rub and sauce called it pork barrel barbecue <laughs> and uh, sold it in just to friends and and it kept going kept going they got on the shark hunt and, and the shark hunt people uh uh, uh shark tank not shark shark, shark, tank, yeah, shark, shark tank. tank and they got the gal uh, i think her name is barbara the short-headed blind gal yeah and she went in business with them and then she got them some contracts with like uh, uh, Sam's clubs and, and someplace else. Where, and see what, once they did that, then their future was assured. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, they, it's just amazing uh, what can happen if you get a contract with one of those big companies like that. So these guys got it into the A and B stores using their strong arm yeah. tactics and yeah. you know, God, I need, I need to, I need to hire the containers to get my movies. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you telling? <laughs> get into one of these big chain stores into Barnes and Noble with my book and everything into Barnes and Noble. That's <laughs> that was, you know, and, and the mob owned all the movie theaters back in the day. That was they owned the theaters <laughs> and they had this. That's that's yeah. They and the, all the jukeboxes. So they the control all the music and everything. The music, yeah. yeah, that's a story Absolutely. we got to look at. Is is that, the mob? I just looked at that once and I did some uh, research on the mob influence in the music business because during those mm -hmm. times of payola. The disc jockeys were taking money to play certain songs, and and they had a they had a real lock on the music business oh, for yeah. a little short period of time. It seemed like MCA. But uh, so that's uh, uh, corporate America is the real mobsters more than the, they beat the <laughs> they beat the katanas at their own game. Uh, of course, the katanas <laughs> made their money and moved on. You know, they, uh, that's right. You just just got a taste. They didn't have they didn't have to deal with the. Uh, aftermath of having this bad detergent out there <laughs> <laughs> right. somebody else had to deal with that that's kind they of washed like, their hands uh, eventually you know that's why you have the epa and those different uh the fda and all that because so, there's people out there willing to do things like this and, and they don't care about people as long as they can make money yeah and, and the mobs uh you know the mob associates usually they'll they'll finance a guy like that we got a guy here in kansas city he's dead now he just died bob ferrara and, and he was constantly selling crappy things to people. And, but he was a hell of a salesman. He, what he did. Was, salesman. 
Yeah, oh, man, he was good. He, he, and, and he was on juice all the time. I finally found out what his connection was. He, he was not a guy that was really in. But I found out he was on juice loans all the time. So he was constantly having to come up with all these scams. And, and he would only come up with scams and make more money in order to pay this uh, exorbitant <laughs> interest <laughs> rates. <laughs> he came up in the height of in the 70s, uh, the height of the fuel oil sales when the, the prices were so high and there was like a, uh, you know, they shut down the spigot in Saudi Arabia and, and gasoline prices were high and fuel oil prices, prices were skyrocketing. And Jimmy Carter got on the TV and said, just wear your sweater and turn your thermostats <laughs> down to 75 degrees or something. And, uh, <laughs> basically cost him the presidency, that and the, the Iranian uh, deal. Oh, but, yeah, uh, but people did not like that fuel oil shortage that were trying to stay warm in the winter. And, and this guy came up, he was going to sell insulation. And people were buying insulation with their houses like crazy, but he sold crappy ass insulation. And, and he hired salesmen, and salesmen would go out, and it was real high priced, and, and they'd go out and sell their relatives, two or three, and then he wouldn't pay them their commission. He just hired more salesmen. <laughs> he, he, he pioneered that with vacuum cleaners, these $500 vacuum cleaners. He pioneered that sales technique, getting young people to come in, and they'd sell a grandma a high-end vacuum cleaner, and they'd make like a $150 commission on it, what was seem a really high commission. This guy would make about $300 on the sale, and then he wouldn't pay their commission and, and, uh, and just fire the kid and, and get another kid to go out and sell. And he, did, he just would continually did that all his life. It's good work if you can get it. And he was a hell of a salesman and he could sell these kids and these young people to go out and sell his products for him. Uh, it, was just, it was amazing. I sent an informant into him, but she got scared. <laughs> yeah, she was, she went in there and asked for a job, never got to set her up in the sales training class, but they were like, she was good looking. And, and these guys were kind of, you know, she just got a weird mm -hmm. vibe from him. So she said, yeah, and she was not a police officer or anything. And she was just a young gal that thought she wanted to be a cop. And I, I got her to go do this. <laughs> a little too rapey to sell vacuums. Yeah, yes. Uh, she, uh, she could not pull it off. She ended up being a cop and had a whole long career, but she was not going to go back in and work undercover as a attractive young woman again. <laughs> <laughs> I think she did some narcotics work, but she had about, you know, like five goons close by just waiting if anything happened, they come storming in. I just sit her down on her own. <laughs> it was a pretty dicey deal, really. <laughs> but we used to do stuff like that back in the day. <laughs> Today, the management would go, you did what? <laughs> Times change. <laughs> yes. Actually, I never told anybody that I did that. You're so anyhow, now. well, that's the story of Jerry Katina and a great A and P ripoff or uh, uh, extortion, I guess you would call that. That was a good one. It was a good one. It was good. I appreciate you looking that up and finding that, Cam. I don't know. I don't have anything else right offhand. Um, I got a one, one other thing you might be interested in, folks. And Cam, I just got, I guess, got this email. Matter of fact, I'll look up the. I just got an email back. The the new there's a new mob uh, series coming out called Fear City. It's going to be a yeah. really good high end documentary. I know they got Rudy Giuliani on there interviewing him, and, and a lot of FBI agents. And I'm trying to get contact with one of them that was uh, was interviewed on that through an intermediary. I don't really know her, but I've got somebody who got hold of me and said they they knew her mother, <laughs> so they were going to email her and see if she'd come on the podcast. And then I got a an email from. Shannon, somebody was a, with a PR company out in California, and she was going to see one know if they sent me some screeners to look at it. Then they would, uh, uh, then maybe they'd get me some, get some comments from me and use this, you know, like I'm a mob expert and, and uh, I'm, this is my comments about the uh, the documentary they're doing. And I said, well, sure, I'd be happy to. And and I said, if you want, I'd like for you to. Uh, get hold of some of the people who were in it and give me their contact information and I'll interview them for the podcast and we'll talk about the movie and we'll get you some, uh, the documentary, we'll get you some even, even more publicity in it because I've seen the trailer too and it looks pretty good and we have not yeah. had, had anything like that made, you know, on the big, for the big screen with, with high, real high production values. 
uh, for a long time. Uh, There's a big one coming about Whitey Bulger probably in the next year. Is there, year is and a, doc, half, is there a documentary? Yeah, interviewing a bunch of his old associates. That's all it is, is just interviewing people who knew him in the, in the, in the life. They're, they're yeah. working on it right now, and it's going to be it's cool. going to be big, but you're like you're right. There hasn't been anything any real good ones in a long time. There, there's two different companies. They're working on one about the uh, Las Vegas skimming. You know, my movie's about that, but mine doesn't have the production values that they're going to get. And I, I did go out to Las Vegas and interview some agents, and I got a casino employee, but I, I didn't really have any any of the gangsters. I didn't get Frank uh, Culotta, and he wasn't really involved with the skim much anyhow. But uh, well, there's two different companies. I contracted with one of them to help them, and Bill Owsley contracted with one uh, out in the West Coast to help them. Mine was from England, and, and his was from the West Coast. Then uh, uh, the National Geographic Company is doing one. They even flew me back to Washington and interviewed me on uh, on camera for, for it, but nobody, uh, three companies working on it, nobody's come out with it yet, so who knows? I'm... I'm in the preliminary stages, you know, and that, it, there's, everybody's in the preliminary stages or something. So who the hell knows what that means? But I'm, I'm start. I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking around. I've talked to you about it. You know, I won't go into it, but shit, we'll see if we'll see if I start start rolling on something. I've started doing the research and started writing the story. So I mean, you've you've really you've really inspired me to try and try and get myself going. So I'm going to start yeah. reaching out to people here in Chicago and see if I can put to put something together. I don't, you know, I don't want to jinx myself and go yeah. into what, but you you really, you really got my, my wheels turning. So I think I'm going to start trying to put together a project and I'll reach out to some people in Facebook and all, and I've already started doing that. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll see where we go and, and uh, see what we see from that. And I'll let people know as, as, as future episodes come up, how it's coming. Yeah. Up. The folks, he's told me a little bit about this and you'll be excited when you hear about the project, get a documentary going because there's, there's so much in Chicago and, and everything that's out there is dated. Uh, so this was, and, and this one, this particular story is a pretty important story, but it's not really been told from, yeah. from that viewpoint that he's taken it. And there's a lot that's not been told. And it's a really interesting guy. So there's just a, whet your appetite about that. So that's, that's what Cam's got coming up. Like I said, look for Cam on Facebook. You have a, did you, you're going to develop a, a mob oriented Facebook page, aren't you? you got a yeah, title. I'm going I'm to set up a group. Uh, the, the title's going to be Behind the Rackets. Oh yeah, and, uh, Behind I'm, the Rackets. I'm, I'm working on a website too. The website will be, be down a little bit because I'm, I'm, I'm working with the, the format and all, but it's uh, the Facebook page is going to be called Behind the Rackets. Okay. And it's, I'm, I'm, I've already started Posting stuff, but I'm gonna, I'm going to transfer it all, to, and then eventually my website's going to be behind the rackets. I'm just uh, just working on some stuff now, so yeah. Uh, the the page, which I'm 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 late working on Facebook. I'm still learning my way around. My my wife is losing patience with me. <laughs> <laughs> behind behind the rackets. All right, so, well, we'll I'm, look I'm for covering that. everybody everywhere. And and folks, especially you guys that are on Chicago pages, why well, if you see Cam post that, why well, make a comment, <laughs> say welcome, Cam. Absolutely. Kind of inspiring a little bit. It's always kind of inspiring <laughs> somebody pays attention to you. You don't feel like you're doing stuff out here for the public in general, trying to entertain people and educate people, and then nobody ever makes a comment. Like, kind of gets a little bit discouraging sometimes, doesn't it? That's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting pretty good following. I get a lot of comments, and I have a lot of interaction with people, but I've been doing this for five years. Okay, I'll be, it takes a while. <laughs> Right, I got a few years to go. Yeah, you just got to, you know, you just got to keep going. That's all you can right. do, man. That's, that's all. Right. That's that's the, the the secret of success in, in this business, uh, except for that one person out of a million or more than a million, mainly that somehow lightning strikes. I always have these people that want to, they want me to hire them to do something. And I say, you know, that's too high a production value for me. I can't afford that. Yeah. And they'll say, well, you never know. Lightning might strike. Well. Lightning doesn't usually strike, but I tell you what does happen if you just keep doing it, keep doing it, and get a little yeah. bit better, and get a little bit better. Uh, yeah, people like what you do, and and you'll know it sooner or later. You'll start getting getting a good feedback, and you'll know it, and, and you'll get a little better, and a little better. And you got to do it. You can't really do it for the money. You've got to do it for the love of the work. Yeah, Otherwise, exactly you're screwed. Right. You're you're screwed if you think you're you can exactly do this right. kind of. Uh, thing to, to entertain people with uh, history, whether it's about uh, you know, <laughs> the Underground Railroad, the Civil War, the, the uh, uh, Depression, uh, the Prohibition, the mob, <laughs> the, uh, uh, 
the play, politics in the 30s. I'm doing a movie now. I'm working on yeah. about the mob and politics in the 30s here in Kansas City. And I know it's, it's, thing yeah, is, it's not going to be very popular. I don't think it'll be as popular as the other two I've done on a national level that'll be popular in Kansas City. But, you know, it's just a level. Telling those stories is important, though. Yeah. I, it, it's important in the upcoming generations. I think that, as he's, you know, I, I talk to, to my niece and she hears these stories. And, and you know, when we were coming up, when I was coming up, there was, there was the mob and you knew about the mob and all. But I think there's a whole new generation who, for whom the mob is just a mythical thing that they've seen in their parents' movies. Yeah. And so yeah. I think as these stories are reestablished, I, I think it's a, it's a whole new discovery because, you know, the mob isn't really so much a thing anymore. I know people will argue with that, but, it, but it's not a thing that it no, was in the not. 70s. No, it's not. So I think there's a whole group of, of, of young people coming up who, for whom this rediscovery of the mob is, it, I mean, Netflix apparently agrees with me. Uh, yeah. I think that this is, that's kind of what we're, what we're shooting for here. Yeah. Now we got uh, Red, uh, Red Wimette's movie is, was in the middle of being made uh, about his life story and it, they had to just, uh, discontinue, I think, because of this thing. Yeah, but there's a lot of, I, I've, I'm working with two other sets of screenwriters, one of one guy and one of two guys, and just trying to, uh, they, they call me up and they want to uh, have me pick my brain about what it was like to be the police on one side of this thing. And so I, I spent several hours with these guys. <laughs> Oh, I, t I keep telling them, I say, you know, I just want to be a technical advisor. I want you, if you get a there movie go. going, I want to be a technical. I want you to fly, have them fly me out and pay me some money and sit out there on set. Of course, what I do, it, they'll probably be boring as hell. <laughs> 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 All right, Camp, I appreciate it as usual. And uh, great research here. It's a great story. Podcasters out there appreciate it, I know. And uh, we will uh, talk to you later. Absolutely. Right, bye, Kim. Take care.